In chapter eight, we're gonna look at something called confidence intervals. In this first section, we're gonna look at what they are, just the basics of them. All right, back in chapter seven, we pretended to know the true parameters and we asked questions about possible statistics. X bar P had an S. Now we start to get real. We begin with what we actually know. And we actually know in statistics, we start with statistics. Remember, values that come from a sample, and we ask questions about the possible parameters. We are trying to use our sample to make predictions about the population. So we start with what's called a point estimate, and it's the single best guess for this value of a population parameter. And it's called this because it represents a single value on a number line. So for instance, if I want to know the percent of brunettes at the high school, that if I take a sample of 50 students, that my, the percent of my sample is my statistic. And that percent is where I start with a confidence interval. It's the point estimate. So here's the logic behind confidence intervals. We start with a point estimate, some statistic from our population. For instance, percent of brunettes at our high school from our sample. Okay, that, we want to know what the true percentage of brunettes is at the whole high school, but all we have is the percent from our sample. So we start in this example with a p hat. And then I know it's not perfect. So I'm going to build in a margin of error. I'm going to find a value, and we'll calculate this in a little bit, and I'm going to subtract it from my point estimate, and I'm going to add it. And it's going to give me a range of values within which I predict the parameter to be. So a confidence interval is an interval of plausible values for a parameter, and it's calculated by this. We take a point estimate from our sample, and then we add and subtract a margin of error. All right, the maximum distance that we expect a sample statistic to vary from the population parameter is what we call the margin of error. And it accounts for sampling variability, the fact that different samples will result in different estimates and it increases our chance of finding the true population parameter. Okay, we know samples vary, so our margin of error kind of deals with that. A couple things to, to mention. It does not mean that our sampling method was biased, and the margin of error does not account for any bias if it did occur in my sampling method. If there was a bias, sampling variability does not fix it. So then how do you interpret confidence interval? Well, it looks like this. You're going to use this framework of your sentence. We are some confidence level confident that the interval from the minimum to the maximum contains the true and then the parameter that we have in context. And I'll model this for you in the next few slides. All right. According to the Gallup poll published in January 9th of 2013, a 95% confidence interval for the true proportion of American adults who support the death penalty is 63% plus or minus 4%. This estimate is based on a random sample of 1,038 American adults. Interpret this interval in context. So we're gonna use the framework I just showed you and I'm gonna show you what the interpretation should look like. It would look like this. How we are, we are 95% confident that the true proportion of American adults who support the death penalty is between 59 and 67 percent. All right, so notice I have a confidence level mentioned at first, then I mentioned the parameter and context. It's the true proportion of American adults who support the death penalty. That whole phrase is context. It is between, and here's my minimum and my maximum, and I achieve that by finding if 63 is the point estimate, it's the center of my interval, and I'm going to subtract the 4 percent, so 63 minus 4 gives me 59 percent, 63 plus 4 gives me 67 percent, and that's where these two values came from. Now, how do you interpret a confidence level? This is different. What we just did up here was the interval. In other words, what does it mean to be 95 percent confident? Okay, it means this. If we were to take many samples of size n and calculate many intervals, about, in this case, 95% of the intervals will capture the true parameter in context. So it's important that you notice the difference. There is a big difference. And it's just saying that if I do the sampling over and over, calculate many, many confidence intervals, about 95% of them will capture the real value, the true parameter. 
A large company is concerned that many of its employees are in poor physical health condition, which can result in decreased productivity. To determine how many steps each employee takes per day, on average, the company provides a pedometer to 50 randomly selected employees to use for one 24-hour period. After collecting the data, company statistician reports a 95% confidence interval of 4,547 steps to 8,473 steps. All right, so part A, interpret the confidence level. All right, level is the last thing we just talked about. So in, when you look at level, you're looking at your sample size and you're looking at your confidence level. So if I look at those two values and then I incorporate that sentence, it says if we take many samples of size 50, and calculate many intervals, about 95% of the intervals will include, here's my context, the true average number of steps per day for employees. Now B says interpret the confidence interval. It says this. We are 95% confident that the true average number of steps per day for employees is between 4547 and 8473. So I want you to observe the difference between a confidence level interpretation and a confidence interval interpretation. They are very different and you need to be able to do both. Okay, same question, just part C. What's the point estimate that was used to create the interval? And what's the margin of error? All right, so remember point estimate is the center of the interval. And then the margin of error is what we added and subtracted to create the minimum and the maximum. So in order to find my point estimate, I have to realize that it's halfway between the interval. So I take the two ends, the 4547 and the 8473, add them up, divide by two. And I find that right in the middle of those two values is 6510. That is my point estimate. Then to find the margin of error, I can uh, do it one of two ways, honestly. I take the maximum and subtract the point estimate, and I get 1963. Or I can take the point, the, um, the point estimate and subtract the minimum, and I get the same number. Either way, it should be the same, because we're adding the same value and subtracting the same value. So this is how you find your point estimate. This is how you find your margin of error. D says, recent guidelines have suggested that people aim for 10,000 steps a day. Is there convincing evidence that the employees of this company are not meeting the guideline on average? And explain. Well, our interval goes from 4547 to 8473. 10,000 steps is not in that interval. So this is evidence to say that they're not meeting that goal. So I would answer this way. Since all plausible values in the interval are under 10,000, there is convincing evidence that employees, on average, are not meeting this guideline. All right, so what is the formula for calculating a confidence interval? Well, it looks like this, and this is straight off your chart. It's, it starts with a statistic, then plus or minus a critical value, and the standard error of a statistic. All right, now, this statistic is your point estimate, right? It's either going to be x bar or p hat the mean from a sample, or a proportion from a sample. The back end of this interval, all of these two things right here, the product of these is our margin of error. All right, now, um, the next thing to ask is, how do we reduce the margin of error, and why do we want a small one? Well, let me show you this demonstration to, to help you understand this. All right, so what I have here is, it's just an applet that will help you visualize what's happening with confidence intervals. The green line is the true population mean of something that we're predicting here. Okay, this is just for demonstration. Usually we don't know it, but the true population mean is here. And if I have a confidence level of 95% and I have a sample size 50, let's do sample of 25. So each one of these little lines represents a confidence interval. Okay, the circle in the middle is the point estimate, the actual mean of my sample, and then the little arms represent the margin of error being added and subtracted. Now, you will see that the majority of these include, cross that green line, right? That means the true population parameters captured by these intervals. I have one right here that's not. So they're not all going to be because we're just 95% confident. In fact, 24 out of my 25 hit the, hit the parameter, so we call it 96% confident. Now, how can we make this margin of error 
smaller. Well, there's two ways to think about this. You have two things we can change, our confidence level and our sample size. So I want you to look at, if I start at 95, if I adjust my confidence level, let's say I reduce my confidence level to 80% confident. I want you to notice how the arms changed. Did you notice that they got smaller? The, arm, the margin of error got way, way, way smaller. But there's a problem here too. Look, look how many of them don't include the green line now. All right, so you can decrease your confidence level, but you may not capture the real parameter. So what happens then if I increase my confidence level? That means it's a bigger target that hit. If I go up to 99%, all right, look how long the margin of errors got. And my actual capture rate was 100%, so that's a pretty good deal. So confidence level, if I reduce my confidence level, it reduces my margin of error. If I increase my confidence level, it increases it. Now, I'm gonna put it back to 95, and let's play with sample size. Now, we've talked about this before, that sample size is important in stats. The bigger our sample, the better our estimates. So if I start with a sample of 50, Look at the length of our margin of error. What happens if I decrease my sample size to like just 10? Look at that. My margin of error had to get really, really big because there's a lot of error in there if I only have 10 in my sample. So you can see if I increase my sample size, my margin of error went way, way, way down because now my point estimate is much more accurate than before. So we want our point estimate to be accurate because our sample size is so big. So sample size makes a big difference in our accuracy. When we're... So that's the idea here. We have two things we can adjust when it comes to our confidence level or confidence intervals. We have confidence level and a sample size. So let's go back to the slide and recap. Ways to reduce our margin of error. First of all, we said we can decrease our confidence level. The drawback to that is that we're less likely to get a correct estimate out of it. The other way we can reduce our margin of error is to increase our sample size. It does cost more and it is more time consuming, but the smaller our margin of error means we have a more precise estimate. So that's a good thing. We want it to be. Now, what are two important things to remember when constructing and interpreting confidence intervals? Well, first, we assume our, our sample is a simple random sample, that it's not stratified, it's not cluster sample, it's not anything weird, it's just a simple random sample. Another thing that we um, always assume is that our margin of error covers chance variation from random sampling. It does not fix any kind of bias in our sample. So be careful that you don't say the margin of error will adjust for bias. It won't. It will only adjust for sample variation. All right, last example. In a 2009 survey, researchers asked random samples of U.S. teens and adults if they use social networking sites. Overall, 73% of teens said yes, and 47% of adults said yes. A 90% confidence interval for the true difference in the proportion of teens and adults who would say yes is 0.229 to 0.291. So part A, interpret the confidence level. Okay, we did this before, I just wanna give you one more practice on this. For confidence level, we need to know our sample size, which was, did it, and they tell us our um, confidence level is 90%. So if we calculate many intervals, since we don't know a sample size, we don't mention it, okay? But the idea is if we calculate many intervals, about 90% of them, that's our confidence level, will contain the true difference in proportions to teens and adults who say yes, okay? Notice it's the difference in proportion. So basically we're subtracting these two values to find out what's the difference between teens and adults. Confidence interval. So we would say we are 90% confident that the true difference in proportions of teens and adults who say yes is between 0.229 and 0.291 stated right here for me. All I have to do is use that framework I gave you for confidence interval. All right, same question, just part C. Based on the interval, is there convincing evidence that the proportion of teens who would say yes is higher than the proportion of adults would say yes? So if we're looking at the difference, if I take 
the teens first and then the adults. If I subtract teens minus adults, if the teens is really higher, then the answer I get when I subtract is going to be positive. If the adults was higher, a higher percentage, and I subtracted teens minus adults, then my difference would be a negative difference. So because the interval of plausible values of the difference of p hat, teen minus adult, they're all positive. There is convincing evidence that the proportion of teens is greater than the proportion of adults. Okay, And we know that because there's a positive difference. Now, part D, how would the interval be affected if we used a 99% confidence level instead of a 90% confidence level? So let's think about this. We're, we're making our target bigger. We want to be 99% confident instead of 90. So if our target's getting bigger, that means my margin of error has to get wider, which makes the interval larger. So the interval will become larger.